On December 2nd, 1902, a new organ given by Mr. Charles Ham in memory of his wife Mary was dedicated. When the organ was installed, the baptistry was moved from under the choir loft to the back of the chancel. On March 6, 1912, the trustees authorized the purchase of two properties adjoining the church property at the west side, 76 Ambrose and 19 Jones Avenue, having the view to build a new Sunday school building. The congregation was so enthusiastic in their support of this new building fund that in November of 1915, at a regular meeting of the congregation, the building committee engaged an architect and proceeded immediately to secure working plans. During the construction of a new building, it became evident that a new location would be necessary to continue worship. This became the chapel at Exposition Park for the use during building operations. You will see by the blueprint of the renovation, an attempt was made to save the old Sunday school building, but in the end the decision was made not to save the building, but to work the materials into a new Sunday school edifice. A part of this decision was related to the new departmentalization of the Sunday school, which included separate rooms for the large adult classes. It was also decided to extend the auditorium 50 feet east towards Lake Avenue in order to reverse the direction of the seating, placing the chancel area at the east end and increasing the seating along sloping balcony at the back of the space. On April 8, 1917, Easter morning. This was the last Sunday the congregation would worship and attend Sunday school in the 1891 church building. Following the morning worship service, the entire congregation gathered outside the church for a picture. And here you see the announcement that appeared in the bulletin that says that on next Sunday, April 15th, our services will be held in the chapel at Exposition Park. And here we have the bulletin for the first Sunday worshiping in the chapel at Exposition Park. And here is a picture for the groundbreaking for the 1917-1918 building. Here we have the bulletin on November 29, 1917 for the laying of the cornerstone. The final design did not follow the original plans. On the Ambrose side, the Sunday school building extended to the west was elongated. The portion to be built to the west on Jones Ave side was never built. And here we have additional pictures of the exterior of the building. As we move inside, you'll see a picture of the auditorium from the balcony towards the chancel. And now a picture of the auditorium from the chancel to the balcony. And here we have the adult Sunday school classroom on the third floor. And here's a prayer room, women's headquarters, and Mrs. Montgomery's classroom. And now the Woodbury room, and the young people's department, also the gym in the basement, a Sunday school office, a church office, and the teacher's training room. The corridor between the auditorium and the Sunday school building, the primary department, and divided space for individual classrooms. Here we have the kitchen and the boiler room. It was on March 31, 1918, Easter Sunday, that all the Sunday school classes marched from Exposition Park back to the new church building. And from June 9th to the 16th, 1918, the church celebrated Dedication Week for the new church. It was on December 31, 1928, at the New Year's Eve watch night service,
that the mortgage for the 1917-18 building was burned. From 1891 until the 1920s, Lake Avenue Baptist Church membership grew to over 2,800 people, and with that growth came the need for additional pastoral leadership, first assistant pastors and then associate pastors. The first assistant pastor was Harry Rogers Chamberlain, born in Ashtabula, Ohio. He attended Harvard University and was licensed to preach at Dorchester Baptist Church in Dorchester, Massachusetts. After Harvard, he enrolled at Rochester Theological Seminary in 1904 and assumed the position as assistant pastor at Lake Avenue Baptist. During that time, he was responsible for the Sunday school and other duties. After his graduation, he went to Morgantown Baptist Church in West Virginia and then to Emanuel Baptist Church in Newton, Massachusetts, where he died in 1918. Next assistant pastor was George Warren, born in Derbyshire, England. He attended the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. Following his work at Southern, he went to Colgate University and Syracuse University before arriving at Rochester Theological Seminary in 1904. George graduated from RTS in 1907 and was called to serve as assistant pastor at LABC starting in 1908. In May of 1909, he was called by LABC to serve as the interim pastor following the resignation of Dr. Barber and prior to Dr. Bevan being called. From LABC, he served as pastor of Calvary Baptist Church in Syracuse, and from there as the secretary of the YMCA at Camp Wadsworth, South Carolina, following that military service in the European theater until the end of World War I. Following the war, he served at First Baptist Church in Batavia, New York, until the end of 1942. Next assistant pastor was George Milton Bardley. Born in Augusta, Maine and educated there and in Connecticut, he went on to Brown University and then in 1903 entered Rochester Theological Seminary. He held a variety of ministry and secular jobs, working in music ministry at Park Avenue Baptist Church in Rochester, New York. He served at LABC for two years, and from there he went to the YMCA College in Chicago. And from there he resigned the pastorate and ended up working in secular work until his death. The next assistant pastor was Archibald David McGlashan, born in the small town of Castleton, Colorado, and educated at William and Jewell College. William and Jewell College, founded in 1849, was a Baptist college. From 1907 to 1908, Mr. McGlashan served as the assistant principal at the Grand River Academy in Gallatin, Missouri, and it was there that he was ordained by the Baptist Church. Following a short pastorate in Laurel, Montana, he moved to RTS and served at LABC as assistant pastor from January 1914 to June of that year. Following graduation, he and his wife traveled to serve on the Baptist mission field in Swatow, China. Poor health brought them back to Rochester, New York, where he continued to serve in a variety of pastorates and secular employment. The next assistant pastor was Charles Berry, born in Plattsburgh, Missouri. He attended Findlay College and Auburn Seminary. While at RTS, Berry served at LABC from September 1914 to January 1915. Following his time here, he went to a variety of pastorates and other ministry opportunities throughout the country. Berry died on September 20, 1946. At that time, he had been working with the U.S. Department of Interior Indian Affairs Office in Oklahoma and in Buffalo, New York. The final assistant pastor of this period is Reverend Yapel, who served at LABC from 1925 to 1929, when he then became the senior pastor at LABC. <laughs>
December 2, 1902, the inaugural organ recital for the new memorial organ was held, donated in memory of Mary Ham by her husband Charles. Florence Barber was quite the musician in her own right. Between 1904 and 1919, she had numerous compositions professionally published as sheet music. In 1904, while preparing a series of Sunday evening sermons entitled Hymns That Help, Clarence Barber wished to use a poem by Catherine Lee Bates, America the Beautiful. It was put to music by Samuel Ward, and thus America the Beautiful was launched. On May 5, 1907, the church choir was disbanded and replaced by the Dossenbach Quintet, which would supply music for the morning and evening services, an experiment that would continue until 1919. In 1916, with the advent of the Wednesday Night Club, its own songbook was published and shared with other organizations. In 1917, when the church was under renovation and reconstruction, the Dossenbach Quintet continued to lead worship that took place at Exposition Park. And in 1917, North Presbyterian Church Choir performed at LABC at Exposition Park with the Dossenbach Quintet. April 1918, George Fisher redesigned the 1902 organ to be rebuilt by the Hook Hastings Company, Boston, and installed in the reconstructed church building. It was on June 11, 1918, that the inaugural organ concert was given by the New Church Dedication Week, June 9th to 16th. Here on March 9, 1919, we have the bulletin for the 25th anniversary of George Pfister's service as organist. Around the same time, Hermann Dossenbach gave a violin solo recital during the week-long 50th anniversary celebration. At the evening service, the Deegan chimes given by Clinton Howard in memory of his son, John Howard, were dedicated. And here on November 28, 1922, we have a recital bulletin that was presented under the auspices of the choir. Here's a picture of that choir at a choir picnic. And here's the picture from 1923. And here is a great image when dogs were banned from being at choir rehearsals forever. September 20th, 1927, Bert Griswold, former organist of the Albion First Presbyterian Church, took the organ bench at LABC. And on April 26, 1926, George Fisher bid LABC farewell after 34 years of service. On March 13, 1929, Herman Dossenbach played an old-time music event to honor Dr. Barber, who had resigned to become president of Brown University. And here we have a picture of the 1930 LABC Church Choir. On March 21, 1930, C.A. Lehman was appointed Assistant Pratt Professor of Public Speaking and Church Music at Colgate Rochester Divinity School, and at the same time he became the Director of Music at LABC, with half his time at the seminary and the other half at LABC. And fortunately, during these years, LABC also had a church junior choir and an orchestra. It's clear to see that during these years, the impact of church music at LABC continued. 1901 to 1931 were very active years for the LABC Sabbath School. The Deacon Woodbury class likely was formed prior to 1900, but the first dated picture in the archives dated 1903. The Barrett class was organized in 1903. Helen Barrett Montgomery was the teacher of this class until her death in 1934. The class was named after her father, Dr. Amos Judson Barrett, who was the second pastor of LEBC. Eventually, the Barrett class merged with the Montgomery class, and the last recorded picture of this merged class is dated 1966. Miss Shabir's class is shown in the picture here. One of the students is Miss Mary Laird. Mary became a nurse, served in World War I in France, and on her return, she formed the Visiting Nurse Service in response to the 1918 flu pandemic. The Montgomery class was established with William Montgomery as teacher, and at one time in its history there were over 60 members. Eventually the class merged with the Barrett class, making it co-ed, and its last record is from 1966. Here we have an early primary department, and 1908 kindergarten graduates. 
In 1909, the Sunday school was being run by a Sunday school council, and from the beginning it had its own constitution. And the Sunday school was often responsible for Christmas activities. In 1910, Miss Charlotte Brown was appointed the superintendent's assistant in the Sunday school. Between 1900 and 1920, the term for Christian education bounced back and forth between Sunday school and Bible school. And it was in 1913 that the LEBC Bible School adopted the Graded Bible Lessons International Course. The white gift collection taken for missions and ministries eventually was called the Christmas Offering. Every year, the Baptist Bible Sunday Schools statewide would make a report to the New York Sunday School Association. In 1919-1920, the LABC Sunday School published a pamphlet titled Ideals, which outlined the goals for the coming year. And in 1920, the Church began a three-year plan to develop a closer relationship between the Sunday School and the Church. This plan developed considerable attention across the country and all over Canada. Reorganizing the Sunday school into a church school required an updated constitution. And the new plan included a nursery and kindergarten so young parents would feel comfortable attending the regular worship service, another new idea. And soon after Rally Day 1922, Dr. Bevan called a few younger married people into his study to discuss a new class, and the fireside class was born. There also existed a young women's class and a business girls class. And from 1920 to 1929, the Sunday School Church School was led by three general superintendents, Mr. Beers, Mr. Fiske, and Mr. Joyce. Here's the married people's class, Mr. Searing's class, a young women's class social event. Mr. Baraka held a young men's class. And Mr. Starquist held the class unusual, a class for high school seniors, juniors, and sophomores. The class unusual was not limited to LABC and New York State. Here's Miss Young's loyalty class. The Bevan class picture. And Mr. Phillips class. Here's Mrs. Simon's class. And Mr. Sabin's class. By 1930, the three session plan was firmly in place. Times were hard, but church and church school continued for the most part as usual. In March 1925, the young women's class presented a performance of The Romance Hunters, this is the beginning of what would become the Lake Ave Baptist Players. In its final form, it would hold monthly meetings, elect officers, manage its finances, and consisted of multiple committees. Each year, they would hold two or three productions. Some were religious in nature and others secular in nature. It consisted of young adults, and at times they were joined by semi-professional talent. Proceeds from the public performances were given to mission work or other ministries of the church. On March 26th and 27th, 1925, The Romance Hunters by Elizabeth Gale was presented. It's a play about a kind-hearted spinster who plans for the niece the kind of romance she always wished for for herself. In February of 1926, 
a case of suspension and Prexy's proxy were presented by the business and professional girls class. In January 1929, The Servant in the House by Charles Rand Kennedy was presented. It's a symbolic drama in which the theme is the brotherhood of man. In April 1929, Dulcie, a comedy in three acts, was the second production done by the LABC players. It was written by George Kaufman and Mark Connolly, and the production included Jane Bromley and Leon Stebbins in leading roles. A month later, the LABC players presented, once again, The Servant in the House, this time at the Christian Endeavor Convention held at Salem Church. To kick off the 1929-1930 season, the LABC players performed Captain Applejack. January 23 and 24 of 1930, the LABC players performed The Passing of Third Floor Back. It's in this production that we start to see how the LABC players was organized, listing the officers and production managers. On December 3, 1930, the LABC players, joined by the church staff, presented A Christmas Carol, or The Miser's Yuletide Dream, which was adapted from the Charles Dickens immortal story. And finally, in December 1930, the players also did The Light of the Mystery, a play patterned after the English mystery plays, but in this case it tells the story of the birth of Christ. It was held outside on the triangle in front of the church. It is in this period from 1901 to 1931 that we begin to see the development of a theatrical side of Lake Avenue Baptist Church. In 1904, the Intermediate Society of Christian Endeavor presented a production of Mrs. Wiggs and the Cabbage Patch, a comedy about a Southern family which is coping with poverty. It's interesting to note that along with the characters and cast members of the play, we also find advertisements solicited to help support the cost of production. In 1904, we see the first record of the Intermediate Society of Christian Endeavors, a CE program targeted at young people between the ages of 13 and 17. Between 1904 and 1905, the membership increased to 140 young folk, the largest in the state of New York. This is a letter inviting young people to join this particular group. Here is the 1914 invitation to the annual banquet given by the young people. This particular ministry started in 1912. Note in these two photos the number of sailor blousers. Although they're not dated, it's likely they were taken in the World War I years at the end of the teens. Although it may have been formed a bit earlier, in 1920 we find the young people's ministry that took the form of a Young People's Commission. The members of this commission were elected from the Young People's Sunday School Classes, the Christian Endeavor Society, the Choir, and the Quaintance Club. The 1920s saw the introduction of numerous activities, some of which were aimed at the larger youth population in the neighborhood and at other churches. There is one particular activity built on the art of talking backwards. Can you guess which one that is? We have a variety of pictures of people and events from this period.
and the following is a montage of 1926 newspaper clippings that make reference to events and presentations at LABC by our youth or sponsored by our youth. In a newspaper clipping from 1927, reference is made to the deputation team of Lake Avenue Baptist Society of Christian Endeavor. Deputation teams are defined as a small group of individuals who've been asked to speak on behalf of a larger group or cause. And in another newspaper clipping from 1927, we find that members of the Class Unusual, an older boys Sunday school class, had participated in an older boys conference held in Geneva, New York. The annual Young People's Banquet was held on February 24th in 1927 and featured nationally known Christian leader Daniel Poling. And here is a montage of 1927 newspaper clippings that make reference to events and presentations at LABC by our youth or sponsored by our youth. The annual Young People's Banquet on February 10, 1928, featured guest speaker Rev. A. Ray Petty. And here's a montage from 1928 newspaper clips, again making reference to events and presentations at LABC by our youth or sponsored by our youth. An abundance of newspaper clippings continues for 1929. It was in 1931 that the senior high school department organized an orchestra. This orchestra performed at least once at Fairport Baptist Home. And from February through March 1931, the Senior High Fellowship scheduled a lecture series. And in April 1931, the Senior Christian Endeavor Society presented a play during evening worship. In the 1920s, in addition to the youth ministries already mentioned, there were other activities, the Boys' Work Committee, the Youth Commission, and the Young People's Sunday School classes, all engaged in the work of nurturing the youth of the church. It's also in this era that the Boy Scout Troop No. 53 was chartered by LABC. From 1901 to 1931, LABC youth ministries have continued to be a vital part of church life. The first specific reference to neighborhood ministry is found in a program booklet published in 1921 for the 50th anniversary celebration. The booklet refers to a church service corps, which entailed dividing the city into 10 districts, each having a core of church members under the leadership of a captain. The focus was to invite neighbors to become members of the church, introduce them to the larger congregation, and help nurture them in their faith journey. In 1921, 250 members were enlisted in this neighborhood work, and over the next 100 years, neighborhood mission and ministry would change focus, take different forms, but become a firm commitment of LABC. Following World War I, the influx of immigrants increased significantly and presented a mission opportunity for churches across the land. The Northern Baptist Convention and the Women's American Baptist Mission Society stepped forward with the organization of the Christian Americanization Department in March 1919. The mission effort ultimately was organized at the national, district, state, city, and local church level. 
Rochester was no exception to the influx of immigrants. As early as 1912, we find a Mrs. Simmons who called motherly women of the church together to call on certain Italian folks to speak with them and to teach American ways of caring for their homes and children. A few women responded, and at the same time, some of the Sunday school leaders attempted to begin a Sunday school class for the Italian children of the neighborhood. After a 1922 introduction to the Americanization program, a group of American Baptist women at LABC began teaching Sunday school classes for the Italian youth, and in 1925, a Sunday school community hour was initiated. It was attended mostly by children and some parents. It included singing, prayer, and slideshows on the life of Christ. By 1926, Mr. and Mrs. Aghetto would become pastor of the first Italian Baptist church that took over the Sunday community hour. For three different years, the Christian Americanization Club, or committee, hosted an event for people from other nations, including Cuba, Poland, Denmark, Japan, Armenia, and Native Americans. There was receptions, guests, and an hour program for girls and boys, ending with a devotional hour. In February 1931, the Italian Young People's Club was established with 18 members, in November of that year, Mr. Giacomelli, a student at CRCDS, was appointed the Italian student pastor for work with the Italian persons of LABC. On September 4, 1918, Mrs. Mary Carmen joined Lake Avenue Baptist Church, and by November 19th of that year, she was appointed church school principal and Sunday school visitor. In the 1920s, she was appointed to serve as the church social worker in the neighborhood. To aid in the church school and parish visitor programs, two cars were acquired. And upon 20 years of service, Mary was the guest of honor along with Mrs. Ruth Ron, pastor's assistant, at a testimonial dinner celebrating each of their ministries. In August of 1942, Mrs. Mary Carmen retired and her time at LABC was the beginning of the history of the Carmen family serving in ministry and mission at LABC. In 1884, after moving into its newly planned house of worship, LABC moved brick by brick their old Sabbath school down to Lyle Avenue to become the new Lyle Avenue Sabbath School Mission. And on July 1, 1890, the Lyle Sabbath School Mission was formally organized into Lyle Avenue Baptist Church, along with 60 members of LABC who were dismissed from the congregation for that purpose. Unfortunately, in 1966, the Lyle Avenue Baptist Church experienced a devastating fire, and while they would recover in time, in 1984 the congregation voted to disband and their building would become Cameron Community Ministries. In the early years of the 19th century, a number of Polish immigrants arrived in the United States. While most were Catholic, there were a number who were Baptist. It was between 1900 and 1910 that the Polish Baptist movement began in Rochester, led by Reverend Ludwig Adamus, who had been a student at Rochester Theological Seminary. And with the assistance of the Baptist Union of Rochester, which included LABC, this group of individuals took possession of the church building at the corner of Hudson and Roycroft Drive, forming the Polish Baptist Mission of Rochester. Even as late as the 1930s, this church was one of only 17 Polish Baptist churches in the United States, and over the years, LABC Women's Mission Society became supportive of the church in many ways. And finally, in the 1920s, when the neighborhoods then known as the Lakedale area, north of the cemeteries off of Lake Ave, continued to grow at such a great rate, Dr. Bevan, pastor of LABC, and Mr. Richard Kemp decided that a Sunday school mission needed to be established. And so in 1927, this new venture began. In 1928, the mission was organized into a church known as Church of the Master, Reverend David S. Matthews was called as the first pastor.
The church was formally founded on Thursday, March 29, 1928. The edifice then was dedicated in 1929. And then in 1944, plans were laid for the construction of a sanctuary to be added to the educational building. But due to World War II, the fundraising campaign lagged and a new effort was made in 1949. Finally, after a couple of setbacks with fundraising and building, on May 15, 1955, the first worship service was held, and on June 5, the new Alfred Bevan Memorial Sanctuary was dedicated. In the early days of radio, LABC recognized the potential for new forms of ministry through this relatively new form of media. The church applied for and received a license in 1921. On January 9, 1922, Reverend Dr. Bevan was the first preacher to broadcast a sermon by radiophone to a 35 to 40 mile radius. This was the beginning of the church's WABO radio station, which competed at that time with WHAM and WHEC in the early 1920s. Unfortunately, this new form of ministry was interrupted shortly after it began when the FCC passed new regulations which required that all radio stations hold a commercial license. Broadcast was temporarily disconnected, but an agreement for the operation of the station was struck with the Hickson Electric Company, which in 1927 would fully acquire the license. Here we have an image of Lawrence Hickson at the controls. And once again, another image of Dr. Samuel Bevan in the pulpit. Over the years, station WABO built up a large congregation of radio church listeners. Here we have an image of Reverend Whitney W.S.K. Yarple, associate pastor of Lake Avenue Baptist Church, in the pulpit before the microphone of the station WABO that at that time was noted as being owned and operated by the church. After numerous transfers of the license, WABO would eventually become what today is WHEC television station. LABC stayed on the airways throughout the transitions until the early 1950s. As you can see, by the use of this newly formed type of media, LABC has always been effective in finding new and interesting ways to share the good news of God's love in this community and beyond. Marcina Sherman Riker was born in Castile, New York on July 23, 1852. She began her career as a teacher, but after three years decided that serving the impoverished was her duty. In 1880, she then enrolled in the Rochester City Hospital Training School for Nurses, graduating in 1884. After earning her MD at the Homeopathic Hospital in Cleveland, Ohio, and further study in New York City, Marcina returned to Rochester and set up a private practice that focused on women and children. Upon her return to Rochester, she immediately joined the Lake Avenue Baptist Church, where she met her husband, Wentworth Riker, and she took a position at the Rochester Homeopathic Hospital, now known as Genesee Hospital. In 1894, Dr. Riker became a charter member of the Board of Managers at the Door of Hope, where she also served on the medical staff. Immediately, she began to upgrade the medical practices and the environment of the home, at that time, there were no maternity units in the hospitals, and babies were born at home. But the girls who were cared for at the Door of Hope were for the most part thrown out of their homes in disgrace. Although not known as an active suffragist, she was a friend of Susan B. Anthony, as well as serving as her physician. When Susan B. fell ill in 1906, Marcina took charge of the house, frequently spending the night at Susan's bedside, and she was there with Susan B. when she died. In 1900, the annual meeting of the Monroe Baptist Association was held at Bronson Avenue Baptist Church. Following a keynote speaker, Rev. Dr. Walter Rauschenbusch, Dr. Riker rose to her feet and clearly explained the necessity for establishing a home for the needy Baptist members. 
Although a committee was formed, it took until 1904 when the association met at Clifton Baptist Church that Dr. Riker was called to the platform to report to the committee again and explain the need and went on to outline some means by which it could be accomplished. A motion to move forward was passed and within a month the committee requested a special meeting of the association held at First Baptist, Rochester. In December of 1904, the Monroe County Baptist Home, Fairport Baptist Home, was chartered and opened its doors on July 5, 1905. The first two residents of this new home, Mr. and Mrs. Ordway, members of Lake Avenue Baptist Church. It was in 1921 that Dr. Riker was called upon to assist a group of Baptist churches in central New York. They were attempting to establish an orphanage in the Oneonta area, the result was the Upstate Baptist Home for Children, which today is known as Springbrook and cares for differently abled children and adults. Dr. Riker also had an active role in the Women's Christian Association, which was the forerunner to the YWCA, and the Christian Temperance Union. Marcina died in her home on Lorimer Street, across Jones Park from the church, and is now buried at Mount Hope Cemetery. Next we have Mary Laird, who was born in Bristol, Quebec, and moved to Rochester in 1887, settling in the Lake Ave neighborhood. After graduation from the Rochester General School of Nursing, Mary served on the hospital staff as probation instructor, and then in 1913 went to Columbia University to study public health nursing in the School of Social Work. During World War I, Mary volunteered to serve with a medical team from Rochester in France. She returned to Rochester in 1919 to find the city engulfed by the flu pandemic. Mary determined that caring for people in their homes was a good way to contain the flu, as they would not travel to the hospital where they could get others sick. This theory resulted in the creation of the Visiting Nurse Service in Rochester. Miss Laird served with the Council of Social Agencies as Secretary of the Health Division and then later served as a visitor for the day nursery of Baden Street Settlement House. During the 1920s, Mary served as the president of the Genesee Valley Nursing Association, president of the Social Workers Club, national chair of the Public Health Nursing Section of the American Public Health Association, and board member for the National Organization for Public Health Nursing. Mary was a self-taught weaver, a skill she continued to apply after she moved to Fairport Baptist Home, and just before she died at the age of 100, she was at the loom weaving. Helen Barrett Montgomery was born in Kingsville, Ohio, July 31, 1863, the eldest of three children. After living with her family in Lowville, New York, the Barretts moved to Rochester in 1871, when young Helen was just nine years old. Her father eventually, after time at Rochester Theological Seminary, graduated in 1876 and accepted the call to pastor Lake Avenue Baptist Church. Helen was baptized at the age of 15 and quickly took on the teaching of the boys' Sunday school class. Her early education was at the Livingston Park Seminary. In 1880, she withdrew from the seminary in order to focus on mathematics in preparation for admission to Wellesley College. In 1884, following her graduation from Wellesley, she returned to Rochester and taught at the Rochester Free Academy, Rochester's first high school. The following year, she became the co-principal at the Wellesley Preparatory School in Philadelphia. After one year in Philadelphia, she turned down an offer to take a professorship at Wellesley and withdrew from consideration to become president of two colleges. Instead, she returned to Rochester to marry William A. Montgomery, who was much older than Helen and was a well-known Sunday school teacher at Lake Avenue Baptist Church. After their marriage, they took up residence in Rochester, and Helen immediately formed a women's Bible class named after her father. Helen was encouraged by Susan B. Anthony and Mary Gannett to become involved in a great deal of civic work in Rochester. While Helen was involved in a great deal of civic work, perhaps most significantly was the fact that in 1899 she was elected to serve as the first woman on the school board. Shortly thereafter, she assumed the position of president 
and during her tenure, significant reforms took place in the Rochester Public Schools. In 1997, at a rededication ceremony, the Rochester school system rededicated school number 50 as the Helen Barrett Montgomery School. In 1898, in response to the push to allow women to be admitted to the University of Rochester, a fundraising campaign was started and Helen was the campaign chair. In the end, it raised $50,000, and for the first time, women were then admitted to the University of Rochester as full-time students. All the while, growing up in the church, Helen had many opportunities to preach, and when Dr. Barrett died on his way to services, Helen stepped in. During her two years that the church searched for the new minister, Helen frequently took the pulpit, and in 1892, the church licensed her to preach. In addition to teaching her Sunday school class, Helen engaged in several church programs that ministered to youth. In 1931, Helen gave $25,000 to build the President's House on the campus of Colgate Rochester Divinity School. The house was named Montgomery House. As we return to the Women's Mission Society, we continue to learn of the many ways they impacted the life and ministry of Lake Avenue Baptist Church. In 1902, the Society established a missions library and added a librarian to their list of chairwomen. Initially, more than 60 volumes on missions around the world were collected, eight of which were donated by Helen Barrett Montgomery. And by the end of the 1902-1903 program year, it was believed that the LABC Women's Mission Society was the largest such society in any individual church in the world. In that program year, the membership increased from 343 to 418. The Combined Foreign Mission Society and Home Mission Society had adopted a monthly meeting format that included an afternoon session and a dinner to which the husbands were invited, and then an evening session. And beginning with the 1902 program year, it was decided to adopt a program focus. Also mixed into the meeting sessions were presentations of local ministries and missions. They had also established a morning watch program, which asked each of the members to begin their day by offering up prayers for the spread of the gospel. And in 1903-1904, Mrs. Montgomery had not finished leading their study of missionaries before Carrie, so continued with the following sessions. These sessions included such topics as Saints of the Church Universal, John Wycliffe, a group of great Catholic missionaries, and Count Zinzendorf and the Moravian Missions. The women had also put into place a way to raise funds for the mission work of the denomination, as well as the missionaries that LABC had put onto the mission field or chosen to support directly. Each member was issued envelopes that they were asked to fill weekly to be collected at the monthly meeting for disbursement. The theme for 1904-1905 was Japan. By May, the focus was broadened, but included a final look not only at Japan, but also at Japanese in America. It was during this program year that LABC appointed Reverend and Mrs. Bodden to serve as LABC missionary pastors in India. The Bodens were faithful in reporting to the church of their work. For the 1905-1906 program season, the Society added three local missions, including the Young Men's Christian Association, the Young Women's Christian Association, and the Juvenile Court. The theme for that year was Africa. And in the midst of all of this, each program year of the LABC Women's Mission Society, one meeting program was given over to celebrating the baby band work. Throughout the course of the first 10 years of the 20th century, a program called Reading Circles that had been introduced at the end of the last century gained interest. The assigned book for the 1906-1907 season was Christus Redemptor by Helen Barrett Montgomery. Included in other themes that the Women's Mission Society focused on in future years were missions to the islands, a cruise to the South Seas, and the Hawaiian Islands. 
Maoris and the Papuans of New Zealand and New Guinea. Two meetings on the Philippines. And there were also discussions on the readings about hero missionaries and the Cannibal Islands. It was in the program year of 1907-1908 that we saw a major change in the meeting schedule. The dinner and the evening session were eliminated, and the new meeting schedule moved up the start time to 3 p.m. and the end time to 5.30. This change was necessitated by the larger church adopting the Wednesday night club model, in which church entities met on Wednesday, beginning at 3 and ending by 10 o'clock. It was also during this time that the city was divided up into 25 districts, and each district had been assigned a captain who was responsible for watching over all the members in her district and encouraging attendance at the meetings. Roll call was taken by the district at each meeting, and each district that had a perfect attendance would be placed on the annual honor roll. It was also during this time that there was a mission barrel chair each year, items that matched the requests of selected missionaries were gathered together by the members, placed in barrels, and then shipped to those missionaries. Initially, the barrels were shipped to home missions due to the expense of shipping. Soon, foreign missionaries were added, and there were more years that a barrel for home missions and one for missions. In some years, there were more than just the two barrels. From the year 1907 to 1909, the program year was focused on the Italian immigrants, with a presentation by assistant pastor George Warren and illustrated by the use of the stereoptician. The remainder of the programs for that year surveyed other faiths of the world. The following are the minutes from the 1909 meeting. On May 25, 1909, the Society held a thimble party, of which the Patchwork Committee had been in charge. By 1910, the study book for the year was Advance in the Antilles. A significant change occurred that year as they established a study class instead of using the selected book as a guide for their monthly programs, and members could sign up to participate in the class. Join us next week as we continue along this journey of the influential work of the LABC Women's Mission Society from 1901 to 1931. Let us continue our journey through the Women's Mission Society from 1901 to 1931. In 1910, the Dorcas Society formed one of the four circles of the church, and in addition to other efforts, they supported the work of the McDarmans in the Congo and the work of Lily Corman at home. The Ladies' Social Circle became the Pastor's Helper's Circle, and they assisted the pastor in making calls to the sick, strangers, and bereaved. The Domestic Circle was formed in 1910 and changed their name to the Worldwide Circle because they wanted to spread the work worldwide. Their first effort was a domestic cookbook, which appeared the following year. Finally, the Acquaintance Club became the Young Women's Club and then the Acquaintance Club again and assisted with the young women and children of the church. Another annual function of the Women's Mission Society was the Christmas Box, which collected various items of use and then sent them to home mission families. The study book for 1911-1912 was The Light of the World by Speer, which set the tone for the monthly programs focused on comparative religions of the world. The two major social events of 1911 was the Lawn Fete and then later the Homecoming Social. And also in 1911, the Society took on a new mission because the Women's American Baptist Home Mission Society had started stationing missionaries at Ellis Island to assist immigrants arriving in the United States. One of those missionaries was Martha M. Troke, who became known as the Angel of Ellis Island. Our archives also include the development of other circles during this period of time. And here we have the 1912 Baby Band annual meeting that gives us a glimpse into what that event looked like.
October of that year, we have an image from the annual Home Day that was celebrated. Under the leadership of the Worldwide Circle, there were presentations about the work of the Women's American Baptist Home Mission Society with the American Indians. And it was in 1914 that we saw the establishment of the Willing Workers Circle. One of their first tasks was the establishment of the LABC Record, the monthly church newsletter. That group voted to support the work of Margarita Moran, who was stationed at the Nellore Girls' School in South India. The second cookbook was published by the Society in 1915. Over the course of time, each circle would adopt and support a mission, a missionary field, or a local or regional ministry. In September of 1916, ten women formed the Emily Barrett Memorial Circle in memory of beloved Mother Barrett who passed away the year prior. Their first missionary focus would be on the Emily Barrett School in Gahati, India, and on missionary Elizabeth Vickland who served at that school. In 1916, the Women's Society conducted a canvas of women who were not members of the societies in a two-day calling event. Their hope was to have women consider joining the society. In 1921, there was the Golden Jubilee Year, recognizing the 50th anniversary of the Women's American Baptist Mission Society. That year, LABC hosted their New York District Gathering. Nationwide, almost $365,000 was raised for foreign missions. LABC alone raised $1,000 in honor of Mother Bevan. Helen Montgomery was the featured speaker. We continue our journey through the work of the LABC Women's Mission Society in 1921, with the celebration of a summer Christmas, where the women gathered together on Mrs. Woodbury's lawn around a decorated Christmas tree. They decorated dolls and had a Christmas pageant, and they also brought useful gifts to be sent to the mission field at home and abroad. 1921 also involved the Fill a Ship in Fellowship campaign, where the women were able to send five cases of clothing valued at $2,500 to the mission field. In December of 1922, Lake Avenue Baptist hosted the annual conference of the World Wide Guild. This organization was founded in 1915 by Helen Barrett Montgomery, Mrs. Peabody, and Mrs. McLeish. It was formed in order to help girls and young women to focus on missionary endeavors, Mrs. McLeish was a good friend of Helen Barrett Montgomery and Lucy Peabody and was deeply involved in the formation of the Women's American Baptist Foreign Mission Society, among other endeavors. It was in 1922 that Mrs. Macy, daughter of Dr. Marcina Riker, then the president of the LABC Women's Mission Society, called a meeting to form a new circle, and with that the Mother Bevan Circle was founded. The Mother Bevan Circle supported the work of Spelman College, a predominantly black college. It supported the Mather School in Beaufort, South Carolina, a school for free slaves. Further, it supported the Moulmein Christian Hospital in Burma, established by Ellen Mitchell. And finally, among the list of other things that it supported was a volunteer motor service in Rochester, New York, the mission of the service originally was to transport doctors and nurses to persons afflicted with the flu, and it was funded entirely by charitable contributions. Over time, other circles were founded, including in 1923 the Helen Barrett Montgomery Circle. This group of women focused initially on the work of Mrs. Peabody in Prague and soon after the work of Reverend Brown in Mexico City, Mexico. It was also during this time that Lucy McGill, a woman who worked for the Women's Baptist Foreign Mission Society in the United States, connected with Helen Bear Montgomery. They collaborated and wrote about missions and traveled the world together, and together they also established the World Day of Prayer. 
In September of 1923, the Society hosted a going-away party for Charity Carmen as she prepared to leave for the mission field in Burma. In 1925, the church mourned the passing of Nina Stevens. She was considered dean among the church secretaries in the community. But in addition to this, she also helped to organize the Young Women's Club, which met for recreation and inspiration. Throughout the 1920s, the efforts of the LABC Women's Mission Society continued. The society began to enroll all newborn girl babies in the society as prospective members. As a demonstration of their commitment to young women, in 1926, the society added a member to the executive committee to represent the Big Sister movement. In the late 1920s, the number of circles continued to expand. One of those circles, the 13th Circles, focused on missions to Japan and later to focus on Miss Vickland, an LEBC missionary to Assam. Each year, the Society published an annual report that included reports from each circle and a summary of the entire work of the Society. The annual report also included a summary of the work of the White Cross. Each circle was dedicated to this work in addition to their standard accomplishments. Although we don't have a date of the founding of this circle, we do discover that in this time we find a focus on the educational work of the Ishihara-san Circle in Japan. In the annual report of the 1929-1930 program year, it's reported that the Society now has 14 active circles and 504 members. And around that time, at what had become the Women's Society Banquet, Mrs. H. E. Goodman was the guest speaker. At that time, she was serving as president of the American Baptist Women's Foreign Mission Society. And now, as we come to the end of the 1930s, we find that there are 15 active circles, with the addition of the Edna Yapel Circle. And it was decided that there would be an afternoon circle that would celebrate with a simple lunch followed by their program and work. Miss Paula Mater was adopted as their missionary to support. She grew up at LABC and went to Japan. And now we come to an end of the 1901 to the 1931 era of the LABC Women's Mission Society. Together we have seen the incredible impact locally, nationally, and internationally of this group of dedicated, loving women at LABC. 1901 to 1931 were very busy years at LABC in terms of mission and missionaries. Luke Washington Vickle was born in Cincinnati, Ohio in 1866 to German parents. At the age of 12, Luke and his family returned to Germany where he graduated from the Reformed Church Academy. Always passionate of the sea, he apprenticed for four years on an English merchant ship and at age 28, he was the master mariner, married and established his home in London. Giving up the sea, he took control of the London Baptist Publishing Society. The American Baptist Missionary Society, having been given the means to build a ship, recruited Captain Bickle to take charge of the ship when completed and the mission on the inland sea in Japan. In 1899, Luke set sail for Japan he died in 1917, and over the course of his service, 52 Sunday schools serving 3,500 students had been established, and in 400 villages, worship services were occasionally held. From the beginning of his mission work until his death, Captain Bickle had served as one of LABC's missionary pastors, and when the captain died, he left no resources, so there were no funds to place a stone at his gravesite. LABC made a contribution to assure that a stone was put in place. W. H. Bowler was born in 1871 in Nebraska. He graduated from Linfield College in Oregon and was ordained by the Utah Baptist Association in Salt Lake City. His first pastorate was at the Baptist Church in Bellevue, Idaho. In 1897, he was asked to move to the Shoshone, Idaho to open up work there. And by 1900, he was appointed by the Home Mission Board to serve as the missionary at large for the state of Idaho. And in 1905, his title was changed to State Evangelist, and the state of Montana was added to his territory. 
In 1907, he became the Idaho State Secretary, then the Executive Secretary of the Baptist Layman's Movement for the Pacific Coast. Until the end of his missionary work, he would serve in various denominational positions that took him back and forth from the West to the Baptist headquarters in New York City. He died in May of 1957. Roberta Helen Montgomery was born in Rochester, New York in March 1873. She desired to join Lake Avenue Baptist Church at 12 years old and later joined in 1890. Roberta graduated from Rochester High School, attended Brockport State Normal, and graduated from Wellesley College in 1897. She returned to teach English for three years at her alma mater, Rochester High. In 1899, she took a position at the Royal Normal College for the Blind in London, England. Miss Montgomery served on the board of the Women's American Baptist Foreign Mission Society of the West, favored women's suffrage, and was a member of the Chicago Wellesley Club. In 1903, Roberta married Reverend William Eyre McKinney. In 1900, he came to Rochester to study at the Rochester Theological Seminary. And after marrying Roberta, they sailed to their assignment at k West China. They returned to the United States to live in the Chicago area. And William died in 1947. There is no record of Roberta's death. L.W.L.B. Jackman was born in Livonia in 1874. After spending one year at the University of Rochester, he graduated from the Geneseo State Normal School in 1896, and after his time there, he had entered Union University Law College in Albany. Following law school, he returned to Rochester and entered into law practice, and in 1900 was baptized at Lake Avenue Baptist Church. Shortly thereafter, he felt a call to Christian service, entered Rochester Theological Seminary, graduated in 1903, and by December of 1903, he applied for and was appointed by the American Baptist Foreign Mission Society. LABC ordained him in 1904. In July of 1904, he married Susie Ransom. Two months after they were married, they set sail to Assam, where they studied language, and then were assigned to Sadia in northern India near the Tibetan border. While there, they had an incredible impact. They helped to establish a hospital in the area, they translated the Bible into the native language, and they also helped to establish a mission site that consisted of a school which eventually would extend up to the high school level. At that time, India was under British rule, so there was a military presence in Sidia as well. There was a major Cloat. He was in charge of the military station and was incredibly generous to the Jackmans. On January 20th of 1920, Mrs. Jackman confessed to Reverend Jackman that she had had inappropriate relations with Major Cloat. Ten minutes after the confession, Reverend Jackman went to the bungalow of Major Cloat called him out, and shot him dead. Reverend Jackman was not charged with murder, as the magistrate allowed for temporary deprivation of self-control as the framing charge. Reverend Jackman was tried, convicted, and sentenced to two years in prison. However, it appears that he never served his time as the Jackman family arrived back in the United States in June of that same year. The American Baptist Foreign Mission Society dismissed Reverend Jackman from missionary service and revoked his appointment on June 23, 1920. He returned to legal practice in New York City, and when he retired, he had been serving as the lead legal counsel for the Brooklyn Edison Company. Samuel D. Bodden was born in Elyria, Ohio on December 2, 1868. In 1890, Mr. Bodden graduated from the University of Illinois. By 1894, he had moved to Rochester to attend the Rochester Theological Seminary, from which he graduated in 1897. In June of 1896, he returned to Ohio to marry Miss Minnie Cotton, and on their return to Rochester, they became active in the Rochester First Baptist Church. During most of their time at RTS, he served as the chaplain at the New York Industrial School in Rochester, where he continued to serve until 1904. In 1898, the Bodens transferred their membership to Lake Avenue Baptist Church, where they immediately became active in the life of the church. 
This was the same year that he was ordained. And in 1899, he became the Sunday school superintendent, a position that he held until they departed for the mission field. His impact on the organization of the Sunday school was significant, as this was the beginning of graded classes. And during those years, their two children were born. The Bodens had been appointed to the foreign mission field and set sail for India, where Reverend Bodden became the manager of an experimental industrial school at Angol. They remained at the school until their first furlough, and when they returned to India in 1915, they left their two children behind in the United States for their education. Upon their second arrival, he was taken up with the task of becoming the manager for the Cavalli Repairment Settlement, a settlement for criminal tribes. The task was the rehabilitation of persons who by heredity and custom had made their living by murder and theft. The Bodens eventually were transferred to Madras, where he was appointed treasurer of the Baptist missions and given oversight of the work in that city and surrounding area. After they returned to the United States in 1938, retiring in Kent, Ohio, he continued support for mission in retirement. Reverend Bodden was officially the missionary pastor for LABC, and they remained very connected to LABC through all of their years, frequently writing letters regarding their work to the congregation. In 1898, Lily Corwin moved to Rochester with her mother from New Jersey. They took up residence in a house owned by the Rikers and joined LABC by letter. Miss Corwin had come to Rochester to accept the position of pastor's assistant during the time of Reverend Dr. Barber. Although her position was assistant to the pastor, here at LABC, her time varied. She visited the sick, encouraged the disheartened, and helped the poor. She was also deeply engaged in the work of the Sunday school, superintendent of the primary department, and led the Junior Christian Endeavor Society. In November of 1905, Lily felt compelled to resign her position with the church in order to take up a home mission role. That same year, she was appointed by the Women's American Baptist Home Mission Society to work among the Indians at Watonga, Oklahoma, where she remained for two years. From Oklahoma, Miss Corwin was assigned first to Reno, Nevada to work with the Plute Indians. However, most of her mission work was in Stewart, Nevada, where she set up a center for children in the home across from the government-run Carson Indian School. She had built the house with her own money and eventually added a multi-purpose building, again out of her own pocket. While there, she also established branches of the YMCA and YWCA. In 1922, Lily's health began to decline and she requested from LABC that they consider sending an assistant. Dr. Bevan and Dr. Riker immediately put forth Ruth Makeham's name to fill that role. Ruth had shown most recently an interest in mission work, and she traveled to Stewart in November of that year. Miss Corwin's health continued to decline, and in September of 1923, she died. She left her home and the multi-purpose building to the Home Mission Society, but her bank account of $8,000 and personal possessions were given to LABC for the continuation of the work at Stewart, and in 1926, Beatrice Underwood took up the work and lived in Lily's house. Peter A. McDiarmid was born on a farm in Ontario, Canada in 1874. He grew up near Tiverton, which is a community within the municipality of Kincardine, and finished his early education in Port Elgin. He taught for several years on Vancouver Island and then entered McMaster University from which he earned his BA degree in 1903. In 1906, he graduated from the Rochester Theological Seminary, was ordained to the Christian ministry and appointed by the American Baptist Foreign Mission Society to serve in Belgian Congo. He traveled alone to Santa Bata where he served his first term. In 1911, he returned to the United States, and while on furlough, he married A. Ruth Holmes before returning to Sondabata, where they would serve until 1930, accepting one school year from 1912 to 1913. 
From 1930 to 1937, they were in charge of evangelistic work in Leopoldville, after which they returned to Santa Bata for four months. Then, they served as field secretaries of American Baptist missions in the Congo until they retired in 1944, and during their time in the Congo, they oversaw 40 churches and 250 village schools. Here we have a news article from 1939 where they were honored by Lake Avenue Baptist Church and spoke at that Sunday service. Peter authored a small book entitled New Dawn in the Congo, and Ruth wrote a short pamphlet for the American Baptist Foreign Mission Society titled A Jungle Tour in Congoland. After teaching for two years at the Kennedy School for Missions in Hartford, Connecticut, they made their home in Monrovia, California, and in 1955, they took up residence at Pilgrim Place. Peter died there in 1965, and Ruth lived on until 1983. 1901 to 1931 were very busy years at LABC in terms of mission and missionaries. Luke Washington Bickle was born in Cincinnati, Ohio in 1866 to German parents. At the age of 12, Luke and his family returned to Germany, where he graduated from the Reformed Church Academy. Always passionate of the sea, he apprenticed for four years on an English merchant ship, and at age 28, he was the master mariner, married and established his home in London. Giving up the sea, he took control of the London Baptist Publishing Society, the American Baptist Missionary Society, having been given the means to build a ship recruited Captain Bickle to take charge of the ship when completed and the mission on the inland sea in Japan. In 1899, Luke set sail for Japan. He died in 1917, and over the course of his service, 52 Sunday schools serving 3,500 students had been established, and in 400 villages, worship services were occasionally held. From the beginning of his mission work until his death, Captain Bickle had served as one of LABC's missionary pastors, and when the captain died, he left no resources, so there were no funds to place a stone at his gravesite. LABC made a contribution to assure that a stone was put in place. W.H. Bowler was born in 1871 in Nebraska. He graduated from Linfield College in Oregon and was ordained by the Utah Baptist Association in Salt Lake City. His first pastorate was at the Baptist Church in Bellevue, Idaho. In 1897, he was asked to move to the Shoshone, Idaho to open up work there, and by 1900, he was appointed by the Home Mission Board to serve as the missionary at large for the state of Idaho. And in 1905, his title was changed to State Evangelist, and the state of Montana was added to his territory. In 1907, he became the Idaho State Secretary, then the Executive Secretary of the Baptist Layman's Movement for the Pacific Coast. Until the end of his missionary work, he would serve in various denominational positions that took him back and forth from the West to the Baptist headquarters in New York City. He died in May of 1957. Roberta Helen Montgomery was born in Rochester, New York in March 1873. She desired to join Lake Avenue Baptist Church at 12 years old and later joined in 1890. Roberta graduated from Rochester High School, attended Brockport State Normal, and graduated from Wellesley College in 1897. She returned to teach English for three years at her alma mater, Rochester High. In 1899, she took a position at the Royal Normal College for the Blind in London, England. Miss Montgomery served on the board of the Women's American Baptist Foreign Mission Society of the West, favored women's suffrage, and was a member of the Chicago Wellesley Club. In 1903, Roberta married Reverend William Eyre McKinney, in 1900, he came to Rochester to study at the Rochester Theological Seminary, and after marrying Roberta, they sailed to their assignment at Katine, West China. They returned to the United States to live in the Chicago area, and William died in 1947. There is no record of Roberta's death. L.W.L.B. Jackman was born in Livonia in 1874. 
After spending one year at the University of Rochester, he graduated from the Geneseo State Normal School in 1896, and after his time there, he had entered Union University Law College in Albany. Following law school, he returned to Rochester and entered into law practice, and in 1900 was baptized at Lake Avenue Baptist Church. Shortly thereafter, he felt a call to Christian service, entered Rochester Theological Seminary, graduating in 1903, and by December of 1903, he applied for and was appointed by the American Baptist Foreign Mission Society. LABC ordained him in 1904. In July of 1904, he married Susie Ransom. Two months after they were married, they set sail to Assam, where they studied language, and then were assigned to Sadia in northern India near the Tibetan border. While there, they had an incredible impact. They helped to establish a hospital in the area, they translated the Bible into the native language, and they also helped to establish a mission site that consisted of a school which eventually would extend up to the high school level. At that time, India was under British rule, so there was a military presence in Sidiya as well. There was a major Cloat. He was in charge of the military station and was incredibly generous to the Jackmans. On January 20th of 1920, Mrs. Jackman confessed to Reverend Jackman that she had had inappropriate relations with Major Cloat. Ten minutes after the confession, Reverend Jackman went to the bungalow of Major Cloat, called him out, and shot him dead. Reverend Jackman was not charged with murder, as the magistrate allowed for temporary deprivation of self-control as the framing charge. Reverend Jackman was tried, convicted, and sentenced to two years in prison. However, it appears that he never served his time as the Jackman family arrived back in the United States in June of that same year. The American Baptist Foreign Mission Society dismissed Reverend Jackman from missionary service and revoked his appointment on June 23, 1920. He returned to legal practice in New York City, and when he retired, he had been serving as the lead legal counsel for the Brooklyn Edison Company. Samuel D. Bodden was born in Elyria, Ohio on December 2, 1868. In 1890, Mr. Bodden graduated from the University of Illinois. By 1894, he had moved to Rochester to attend the Rochester Theological Seminary, from which he graduated in 1897. In June of 1896, he returned to Ohio to marry Miss Minnie Cotton, and on their return to Rochester, they became active in the Rochester First Baptist Church. During most of their time at RTS, he served as the chaplain at the New York Industrial School in Rochester, where he continued to serve until 1904. In 1898, the Bodens transferred their membership to Lake Avenue Baptist Church, where they immediately became active in the life of the church. This was the same year that he was ordained and in 1899 he became the Sunday School Superintendent, a position that he held until they departed for the mission field. His impact on the organization of the Sunday School was significant, as this was the beginning of graded classes, and during those years their two children were born. The Bodens had been appointed to the foreign mission field and set sail for India, where Reverend Bodden became the manager of an experimental industrial school at Angol. They remained at the school until their first furlough, and when they returned to India in 1915, they left their two children behind in the United States for their education. Upon their second arrival, he was taken up with the task of becoming the manager for the Cavalli Repairment Settlement, a settlement for criminal tribes. The task was the rehabilitation of persons who by heredity and custom had made their living by murder and theft. The Bodens eventually were transferred to Madras, where he was appointed treasurer of the Baptist missions and given oversight of the work in that city and surrounding area. After they returned to the United States in 1938, retiring in Kent, Ohio, he continued support for mission in retirement. Reverend Bodden was officially the missionary pastor for LABC, and they remained very connected to LABC through all of their years, 
frequently writing letters regarding their work to the congregation. In 1898, Lily Corwin moved to Rochester with her mother from New Jersey. They took up residence in a house owned by the Rikers and joined LABC by letter. Miss Corwin had come to Rochester to accept the position of pastor's assistant during the time of Reverend Dr. Barber. Although her position was assistant to the pastor, here at LABC, her time varied. She visited the sick, encouraged the disheartened, and helped the poor. She was also deeply engaged in the work of the Sunday School, superintendent of the primary department, and led the Junior Christian Endeavor Society. In November of 1905, Lily felt compelled to resign her position with the church in order to take up a home mission role. That same year, she was appointed by the Women's American Baptist Home Mission Society to work among the Indians at Watonga, Oklahoma, where she remained for two years. From Oklahoma, Miss Corwin was assigned first to Reno, Nevada to work with the Plute Indians. However, most of her mission work was in Stewart, Nevada, where she set up a center for children in the home across from the government-run Carson Indian School. She had built the house with her own money and eventually added a multi-purpose building, again out of her own pocket. While there, she also established branches of the YMCA and YWCA. In 1922, Lily's health began to decline and she requested from LABC that they consider sending an assistant. Dr. Bevan and Dr. Riker immediately put forth Ruth Makeham's name to fill that role. Ruth had shown most recently an interest in mission work, and she traveled to Stewart in November of that year. Miss Corwin's health continued to decline, and in September of 1923, she died. She left her home and the multi-purpose building to the Home Mission Society, but her bank account of $8,000 and personal possessions were given to LABC for the continuation of the work at Stewart, and in 1926, Beatrice Underwood took up the work and lived in Lily's house. Peter A. McDiarmid was born on a farm in Ontario, Canada in 1874. He grew up near Tiverton, which is a community within the municipality of Kincardine, and finished his early education in Port Elgin. He taught for several years on Vancouver Island, and then entered McMaster University, from which he earned his B.A. degree in 1903. In 1906, he graduated from the Rochester Theological Seminary, was ordained to the Christian ministry, and appointed by the American Baptist Foreign Mission Society to serve in Belgian Congo. He traveled alone to Santa Bata, where he served his first term. In 1911, he returned to the United States, and while on furlough, he married A. Ruth Holmes, before returning to Santa Bata, where they would serve until 1930, accepting one school year from 1912 to 1913. From 1930 to 1937, they were in charge of evangelistic work in Leopoldville, after which they returned to Santa Bata for four months. Then, they served as field secretaries of American Baptist missions in the Congo until they retired in 1944 and during their time in the Congo, they oversaw 40 churches and 250 village schools. Here we have a news article from 1939, where they were honored by Lake Avenue Baptist Church and spoke at that Sunday service. Peter authored a small book entitled New Dawn in the Congo, and Ruth wrote a short pamphlet for the American Baptist Foreign Mission Society titled A Jungle Tour in Congo Land. After teaching for two years at the Kennedy School for Missions in Hartford, Connecticut, they made their home in Monrovia, California, and in 1955 they took up residence at Pilgrim Place. Peter died there in 1965 and Ruth lived on until 1983.